So my, my talk centers around, you know, kidney, kidney stones, but not around kidney stones, around infections in the kidney, around uh, pyelonephritis, yield tract infection. I have been fortunate because I was an, uh, invited by NICE uh, to, as an expert witness to talk through the infection guidelines in uh, uh, both urinary infections for males, for females, for prostatitis, and for pyelonephritis, which are uh, currently being updated. How common is the condition? It is very, very common. And uh, it's so common that probably half of the, the females uh, in this room would have a kidney uh, infection or a urine infection uh, in their lifetime. And th that's a lot. And this is not taking into account people who would have recurrent infections because, again, uh, that's a lot. Uh, happy Women's Day, everyone, by the way. And I'm, I'm blessed to be here, honestly. <laughs> And, and supported by female colleagues, which is even nicer. Uh, so to, to, to go through it, what is urinary tract infections and how does it manifest? You've got a mixture. You can have uncomplicated urinary infection on one side to a complicated urinary infection. And then you have various, you know, you can have cystitis, lower tract, pyelonephritis. You can have a recurrent infection. You can have catheter-associated infection. I'll, I'll skip the next one, the one in men. And then you can have uh, urosepsis or infection that causes, you know, admission because they are unwell, they've got a temperature, and so on. This is how it's classified. Uh, simply put, uncomplicated infections can happen in anyone. It's an acute infection uh, of the lower tract, occasionally of the upper tract as well, but mainly of the lower tract, limited to non-pregnant, and that's important, premenopausal women with no other abnormalities in the anatomy or functionality. By that definition, all male infections are complicated. We are complicated people, as you know. But by that definition, male infections are complicated. But the simple infections uh, in females are uncomplicated. If you go to complicated urinary infections, so I've highlighted all men, pregnant females, patients, male or female, with structural or functional abnormality of the urinary system, and or with indwelling catheter, people with renal disease uh, or other immunocompromised patients, you know, such as diabetes. These patients, when they get an infection, it's complicated by definition because, you know, either you need a longer antibiotic course or you need to investigate them a bit more or they have a higher chance of getting unwell. Recurrent infections, again, the definition is if somebody has got two or more proven infection in six months, or three or more proven infections in a year, that's termed as recurrent urinary infections. And I'll come to that in my later slides. Catheter associated, simply somebody who's catheterized uh, or who's had a catheter for more than 48 hours, if they get an infection, then it's catheter associated infections. And then urosepsis, obviously, is you know, anyone with any sort of infection, if they get systemic, un uh, you know, if they become unwell systemically with a temperature, uh, unwell, high inflammatory markers, then they have urosepsis. And they have new guidelines for sepsis, which have been re released recently. So what is an infection? Simply put, it's just an inflammat inflammatory response to the urothelium, the lining of the urinary system, to either bacterial infection. And usually, they would be associated with either bacteria in the urine, or bacteria, or pus cells in the urine, or pyuria. So it, you know, it's a very common condition. Like an inflammation anywhere, it's an inflammation of the urinary tract. So then, what is uncomplicated? We have gone through it. An infection in a healthy patient with a structurally and functionally normal urinary tract. That's the uncomplicated. And complicated where the factors that can increase either the chance of acquiring the bacteria or the result you know, of the bacteria itself or that can decrease the efficacy of treatment. This become your complicated urinary tract. So you have either compromised host or increased bacterial virulence or structural or functional abnormality. And that's important because the treatment is tailored. If you have a simple infection, you know, you don't have to go all out. You might not even do any imaging. If you have complicated infections, then you have to go all out to make sure either it doesn't recur or it doesn't progress to urosepsis. So what are the symptoms? In, if it's a lower urinary tract, you have simple symptoms, frequency, nocturia, dysuria, stinging or burning, 
secondary enuresis or suddenly you've got urgency or you're getting incontinent, suprapubic pain hesitancy. So these are symptoms that a lot of, there is a bit of vagueness about it because it's not e always easy. But you know, th these are the common symptoms of low urinary tract infection or a simple urinary tract infection. And then you have upper urinary tract infections, which we call as polynephritis. And there you have st some systemic illness. So you can have fever, vomiting, general un unwellness, loin pain or, or abdominal or central pain. And these are patients who have pyelonephritis and the treatment is slightly different. And not uncommonly, if untreated lower tract infection can then manifest as upper tract infection. This is staggering. When, when we look at it, 30% of females have had asymptomatic urinary infections needing treatment by the time they're 24. A third of the females have had an infection already by the time they're 24. That's a lot. Males are lucky in some ways. And then nearly half of the women in their lifetime have had an infection. So that's very important. So how do you get rid of it? I mean, I tell all my, I'm a kidney stone specialist, as you heard, I tell all my patients, drink plenty of water. It's the same with this. How many people think they drink more than two pints a day? You can just raise your hands. Two pints, more than a liter a day, let's say, of water. We are, we are, we are down to 30% of the audience. More than two liters a day? I can just literally count. Anka, I'm not happy. You, you are my theatre sister. You need to drink more than two litres a day. Okay, so what do we recommend? We recommend that the urine output per day should be two litres. If the urine output per day should be two litres, the intake should be more than two litres. How do you measure it? You know, a cup here, a spoon, it, it doesn't help. So people who are prone to infection, stones, you should have a half a liter bottle that you have finished so many times during the day. What about tea, coffee, juices? It's all fine, but really clear fluids are the best. Because all of these fluids, you know, your tea and your coffee, we all love it, but they, they are diuretics, they irritate the bladder, and they are not as good as your simple fluids. How do you know? You're not going to keep measuring how much you're passing. You know, that's not very convenient. So the urine should be clear or clearish most of the times. Well, it's not convenient. My lifestyle doesn't allow it. You know, I've just heard. <laughs> how can you do it? I agree. You know, we are all. But I'll tell you, the most, the biggest proportion, if I was to split patients up of my patients, are actually from medical nursing uh, professions. Why does that happen? There's no time for us to drink or to, to wee. Well, you have to make time for that. If you don't make time for that, then you come and meet me at some point, <laughs> which, which may not be very pleasant sometimes. Okay, so, so how do you do it? You either have a, a, the, the good drinking habit is you drink all the time. If it's not possible, then you drink a bit more and compensate it some, some, somehow. So that's the recommended uh, urine output. So, a lot is said about antibiotics and resistance and so on. I think we don't mention uh, enough of the fluid intake. And I, for me, that's the single most important reason why people get an infection. Right, this is the prevalence of bacteria in females. So you can see, and the prevalence up till about 15 to 18 or up to 18 years is very similar to males. And then with, with the onset of sexual activity, the prevalence goes up. And then it kind of stabilizes and towards menopause again, it starts to go up. So it's very important, especially for females, sort of between 18 to 24, 30. We've had a very nice talk just before mine, so I'm not going to go into that. But it's very important to keep well hydrated. Otherwise, you know, the, as, as the, the, the sexual intercourse onset happens, big surge of urinary infections. And some of it then lingers on and becomes recurrent infections, which can be quite a pain, both for the patient and for us. Right, so what is asymptomatic bacteria, where you have no symptoms, but if we, we test a urine, there is bacteria. So routinely, we shouldn't be screening for asymptomatic bacteria, and routinely, it doesn't need treatment. Now, if that applies to women without risk factors, Patients who are well-regulated, you know, otherwise for with diabetes, 
postmenopausal, and so on. Even patients with catheters, because you know, by seven days, all catheters are colonized. Jackie would agree with me there. And so if you if you go and go and try and culture them or try and look for, you know, it's always positive. So you don't have to treat them if they don't have any symptoms. So then the question is, who do you treat them? So you have to screen for bacteria before any urological procedures. So when I joined the hospital, uh, I was very unpopular at the time because I asked everybody should be screened. And like, no, 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 that can't happen. I said, look, that's the only way you prevent the asymptomatic bacteria patients from getting infections afterwards. And now routinely, all patients who have endoscopic surgery either have a dip test or for at least for most of mine have a urine culture. That's the only way I know that's safe surgery. Again, pregnancy, you have to screen and treat for asymptomatic bacteria because the outcomes, you know, there's an impact. So, and, and how do you do that? The dip test, I mean, we are all gone electronic, it's brilliant, but one downside is when the dip test is done, it's not recorded anywhere in the notes. So if you're planning for something, if I'm planning for an intervention, I need a urine culture, not because it's necessary, but because that's the only way I know it's been done. So, and the same rule applies to, to other things. If you've got things that are really important and you don't know for sure, or the dip test is going to be missed, send a urine for culture. Uh, and, and especially in patient group where you think they will need treatment before you do something, or they will need treatment. Please stop me at any point if you need to, because I want this to be very interactive, uh, or throw me lots of questions at the end. Right, so what about uncomplicated cystitis? So we have talked about simple cystitis. What about, what about that? You take a history and I've told you about what symptoms are there. In the absence of any other risk factors for complicated infections, you do a urine dip test and look for either your nitrites or leukocytes or both. Send a urine culture if it's recurrent or if you're not sure. Uh, urine culture, I personally, I like it. The reason is by the time they have presented a secondary care, you know, they have, by definition, they have struggled enough to present. So we generally do it. It may not be the same with primary care because that will be a huge burden for primary care. But if you suspect acute pyelonephritis, if you suspect that they have already had some treatment with no effect, or if it's come back, if it becomes recurrent, or their symptoms are quite atypical, you're not quite sure what's going on, but you suspect that's probably a UTI and in pregnancy. You must do a urine culture in these situations. Symptomatic relief, common sense, you know, paracetamol, non steroidals if they can take it. Antibiotics, short course, three days for simple antibiotics. This is from NICE. And five to 10 days for complicated, you know, for complicated infections. So simple infection, short course, standby antibiotics. I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of it, but if somebody has got a recurrence and you know that they're sensible and they're not going to overuse or abuse it, they can have a standby pack. Especially if people come and they're going on a holiday, they're going somewhere else, they will have less access to, and they know it's a, you know it's a simple infection, they can have a standby pack. If they have fever, loin pain, temperature, then you have to think of pyelonephritis and you have to treat them accordingly. So how do you diagnose uh, or how do you evaluate pyelonephritis then? Urinalysis, Again, look for nitrites, leukocytes, etc. Urine culture, as I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of it because that's the only thing I can see on the result system. I can't see a dip test. So if you have not done it and they don't settle down, then you're looking back. So when they have systemic symptoms, when they are unwell, I think you should send a urine for culture because that will take a couple of days to come back. And if they're not responding, then you can change your treatment. If you haven't sent it, then perhaps you have missed it, or perhaps you will then struggle and you then th start giving antibiotics, which they might, re they might respond to again. Ultrasound scan, I think if they've got an upper tract you know, infection, I would probably do an ultrasound scan for all patients, and I'll come to my latest slides why. I think all patients who have kidney infection need an ultrasound scan. A, to rule out if there's something in the kidney like kidney stone, or also to make sure they're emptying the blood, avoiding, and there's no hydronephrosis, etc. Uh, it's a simple enough test, easily done, readily available, no risk of radiation, and I think it should be offered if you're suspecting that there might be some abnormality. Additional imaging, CT scan, etc. we don't routinely do them, unless by 72 hours, the patient has still not settled. They've still got a temperature. They're still not sure. They've still got a lot of pain, more than what you expect. Then I think you need to do a scan. 
A, to make sure there's no blocking, there's no yellow stone blocking the yellow or there is no hydronephrosis that needs to be drained, or there is no collection, because sometimes, in addition to an infection, they can have an abscess or something like that. So if they have not responded within 72 hours, you should think of alternate imaging. Uh, and of course, the worry always is whether they are going to get septic from it. And, 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 and by that stage, you need to be ahead of the game all the time. So simple antibiotics, pyelonephritis, ultrasound scan, not settling down. Do we need to change it? You've already sent a culture. Change antibiotics if we need to. Get a CT scan if we need to. How do we manage that? In the primary care, if they're pyrexial but otherwise well, it's a simple infection or there's no complicating factors, then you can monitor it and give them antibiotics. They need admission if you think they're dehydrated, they can't take the fluids, have signs of sepsis, or they're pregnant, elderly or frail, or they do not improve within 24 hours of having temperatures despite giving antibiotics. Again, compromised patients, immunocompromised, diabetic, if they've got a foreign body like stones or a nephrostomy tube, and you know there's something else going on, then they need to come in. Why? Because a nephrostomy could have blocked, Kidney stones are known to cause pyonephrosis, pus in the kidney that needs to be drained urgently. And if you don't, these are the only category of patients in urology, aside from maybe trauma, that we see can die from sepsis. So urosepsis for us is really important that it's tackled head on urgently, not tomorrow, not you know, then, there. So if, if we suspect that, they need to be in the hospital, they need to have an urgent scan, they need to be sorted. Right, how do we manage them? As I said, you're in culture, you, you send that off. Now, the antibiotics are variable. I'm not going to say that is universally true for all hospitals because that is based on what the, your local pattern is and that might be different. Currently, it says ciprofloxacin because it's a complicated infection. Ciprofloxacin for seven days or comoxiclav for 14 days. In pregnancy, obviously, you'll give them cephalexin. That's most commonly used. You give them the generic measures, hydration, paracetamol. It's very important to review them again. I mean, in the secondary care, in the hospital, they have a daily wardrobe, so we will review them. But even in the primary care, I think you should have an early review. It need not be in person. It could be a telephone call, but they need a review of some sort. And consider investigations for kidneys, renal tract. If you have got any episode in males, more than two episodes in females, or if they've got protease infection, protease infection usually suggests something else in the urinary tract, like a kidney stone or something like that. So if they've got any of these, you must investigate them by doing some sort of scanning to make sure that there is no structural abnormality. There is a UTI guide. Uh, there's also one for males, but I mean, I've put this one, which I was involved with, which we're probably going to update shortly. But this, there is a guide. So if you guys want to see where to get help, there is one available on the map of medicine, which talk through the red flag symptoms and so on in a systematic way. So, you know, that, that is quite helpful. I know a lot of GP practices use it as a first point of contact, and it's actually quite good. Right, so coming to recurrent infections. So we've already said three infections or more in a year or two or more in six months, that's your recurrent infections. And then which are the female group that are, you know, so if you have young premenopausal, it's, I've always said sexual intercourse, use of spermicidals, new sexual partner, uh, and, and a history of childhood infections. In the sort of other <coughs> range, postmenopausal, if there's previous history, atrophic vaginitis, that, that is known to cause, if they're not emptying the bladder fully, so if the bladder is, that's why post void residual urine, where you ask them to void and scan is important. Because if they're not voiding, there's a pool of urine always there, and obviously that's a higher risk for infection then. Uh, if they're catheterized, etc., that increases the risk as well. How do you diagnose uh, uh, you know, or treat recurrent infections? I don't think they need it. If they have got an underlying factor, provided you have done the basic screening, they don't need an extensive workup. But the first thing to do is behavioral modification. And I think most clinicians, I wouldn't say all, but most do not check the fluid intake. Most patients know that they are not drinking enough, but they still continue not to drink enough. And antibiotics will only do a part of the job. Uh, you know, drinking plenty, keeping hydrated will flush the system, and that is the primary objective in recurrent infections. Using vaginal estrogen replacements in postmenopausal women. Immunoprophylaxis has recently, it has been 
on and off been used. We are just currently doing a big systematic review on this. That will give us some answers on whether there is a role of immunoprophylaxis for these patients. I personally think increasingly going forward there probably will be. Uh, and then what about you know the, the, the backup pack, self-administered, short-term antibiotic? Once you have gone through the process, once you have excluded all the reasons, and if people are still getting infections, then the recommendation is they can have a low-dose antibiotic prophylaxis, one every night. Why night? It's just easy to remember. So one every night they can have it. But you can rotate that every six weeks. So you can start with maybe trimethoprim, then go on to nitrofurantoin, then go on to cephalexin in a rotational basis. So that is not uncommon for a lot of our patients who go on rotational antibiotics once you have ruled out everything else. Or the other option, which was very heavily debated in NICE when I was there, is a backup pack. And I said, well, look, backup pack, if you're going to give a full course of antibiotic, it defeats the purpose. You either go for low dose or you go for full vac. What's the point of giving a backup pack? Because you'll miss how many episodes they're having. Anyway, it's still up in the air. So, yeah, there is, there is a chance that we might say that or they get a backup pack that they can use. So, recurrent infections, things to do, urine culture, post-void, consider ultrasound scan. I, mean, I would probably, by the time they're in the hospital, I'd always do that. And testoscopy, you know, examination of the urethra and bladder is probably not always needed unless you suspect they've got other things. They've got spinal cord injury and they've got a long-term catheter. But sometimes you can have bladder cancer in patients with long-term catheters. You can have bladder stones in them and so on. So if you suspect there's something quite odd, then you can, but routinely you don't need to. Treatment-wise, we've already had a discussion, behavioral, eradicate previous urinary infections, uh, post-cortal prophylaxis, so emptying the bladder before and after intercourse, or having a small antibiotic about half an hour to an hour before, if, you, if that's the pattern you have an uh, infection. Uh, if there's high residual urine, then sometimes you have to empty the bladder and patients can be taught how to do intermittent catheters, perhaps a couple of times, first thing in the morning and last thing before going to bed. And uh, some sort of estrogen, vaginal estrogen for uh, the postmenopausal women. These are the factors with any complicated UTI. Is there any obstruction? Is there any foreign body? Are they avoiding any UTI in males, diabetes, and so on? So the reason why I'm hopping on is important to distinguish between simple and complicated UTI. Complicated UTIs tend to keep coming back. They tend to cause other problems. They tend to cause sepsis and so on. And these are patients who might need admitting in the hospital, closer monitoring, and so on. But the simple infections, if it's not dealt with, can sometimes go on and become complicated. What do you tr how do you treat them? Usually they have a combination of antibiotics and usually they're in the hospital. So you can have, you know, whatever works. So you can have a, a gentamicin type antibiotic if the renal function is fine. So I'm in the glycoslide slide along with another antibiotic. I won't go into which one because I'll show you the data of UHS or what the resistance pattern is. And although this is a generic recommendation, uh, the, the antibiotic protocols you should follow is what is your local policy, because that's what reflects the local resistance patterns. Now then, talking about kidney stones, I couldn't have left it behind. So this is the first study looking at patients with kidney stones and urinary infections when treating the kidney stones have got rid of the infections. And I think this is very, very useful. There's only one other paper. They have done a different sort of study. This is the first one in Europe. So we looked at 103 consecutive patients who either had proven infection uh, or they had a history of recurrent infections. So, you know, more than two in six months or more than three over the year. And in fact, 80% of them nearly had a positive culture beforehand. Most of them, two-thirds of them were females, as you'd expect. It's much more commoner in, in females, you know, the, the urinary infection that is. Stone size, reasonably large stone, 16 millimeters. Just to give you an idea, in most places, stones more than one and a half centimeter, more than 15 millimeter, they'd have percutaneous surgery, which is far more invasive. We did urethroscopy or through the natural route, through the bladder, through the urethra in the kidney. So much less invasive. Anka, come on, you need to nod with me and you need to clap for me. Anka is one of our theater sisters, so she has seen me uh, involved with lots of such procedures. So 
what did we find? So at three months, at six months, at 12 months, at all time points, so at three months, 96% were stone free and infection free significantly. And as it went on, some patients obviously dropped off the follow up, but even at 12 months, almost 80% were stone and infection free. In a small proportion of patients, as the stones recurred, you see a recurrence of infection, which you expect. So this is one of the first studies to show that if you have a kidney stone and an infection, if you treat the stone, the infection gets better. And as the stone comes back, the infection starts to come back. Very logical. And I think that's why, for me, if there's anyone who has got a recurrent infection, if you've got polynephritis, you need to scan the kidneys. And I'm not saying it'll happen in all cases, but if you've got a kidney stone, you must think of treating that to get rid of infection. Going forward, we then recently looked at all patients who had urosepsis, who had an emergency drainage with either a nephrostomy or a stent, and then looked at their elective outcomes of what happened. So these are patients who had urosepsis secondary to a blocked urethelic stone, they had an emergency drainage done, and then electively, once they were better, they had kidney stone treatment. 76 patients, this is the first in the world looking at this, it's being presented later on, and the manuscript is being prepared. And what do we find? We find, of these patients, 36% had an ITU admission from sepsis. The others avoided ITU, but were in high dependency in it, with severe sepsis, secondary to blocked kidney who needed drainage. When we did elective procedure for them, once they had settled, most of them, 97% were stone free. That's, that, that's a very good result. Of which 79% were discharged the same day. The day case rate is 79%. And just for the audience, our day case rates are the best in the world of ureteroscopy. Nationally, two years ago when we looked at it, it was 22% day case rate of getting discharged the same day. Ours was 78%. And it's the same with patients who had been very unwell, electively when you do a planned surgery. So now if you think back, why do you need a urine culture? Because we want the appropriate antibiotics. Because we want them to be as protected as they can be. And when you do elective surgery, you can do a good job. You can make them stone free. Three patients had complications. Two who needed IV antibiotics for an infection. One who briefly went to ITU. But this was very expect I would have expected for a series like this, at least 10% would have gone back to ITU. You might even have expected one or two deaths from urosepsis because treatment can cause that. None of that happened. So this again shows the importance of dealing with infection early, strongly, and doing everything else you can. Just to go through something else, recurrent infections, the other things we are looking at, again, we are doing a review on intravesical antibiotics. So these are patients who are end of the line. There's nowhere else to go. They've tried everything. So in these patients, what about intravesical gentamicin? You give gentamicin, and what about that? Is it going to work? So we are looking at that. Immunotherapy, probiotics. Cranberry, we used to tell everyone to take it. The, the evidence is now split. Most recent reviews show not much benefit. But if I were a patient, I would latch onto anything. Cranberry, water, whatever, give, throw it to me. Because, you know, so if, there's, if there is some benefit in some patients, that's fine. And then d manos. So just to say, when I joined, we, we looked at the trends of antibiotics from this hospital, and we published that for five years. So that included almost 41,000 positive E. coli urine cultures. And we looked at, over the period of five years, what was the antibiotic trends. And if you look at the, the very bottom line in blue is nitroferentoin, a really good drug for simple urinary infections. The reason we don't use in males, it doesn't have a, a good prostate penetration, and we can't use it in people with renal dysfunction but a very good antibiotic. As you keep going up, the resistance level keeps going up. So below the above, the light blue is the gentamicin. Then you have the red, which is ciprofloxacin. And then the top two are your trimethoprim and amoxicillin. And bearing in mind, this is secondary care data. I'm not saying trimethoprim is bad because in prime, by the time we have seen them, these patients have already had the simple things. They have already done the simple things. So we are, but this is the secondary care data of all patients who come in through the door. And then we repeated that with more than 100,000 urine cultures 
from UHS and we looked at the patterns and this was the trends. About the same for trimethoprim, amoxicillin on its own, nobody would give it, people would agree, I mean, you know, you won't give it for UTI. But for the rest of them, it's fairly consistent in terms of the resistant levels. So what do we do in urology currently? For all endoscopic procedures, we give them a single shot of intravenous gentamicin. You can, dose can be varied depending on the renal function. For simple UTIs, trimethoprim or nitroferentoin. And for complicated UTIs, ciprofloxacin. Bearing in mind, there's another drug called phosphomycin, which is coming in slowly. And we have just done a review on phosphomycin. Perfectly good drug. I have to say, I'd be cautious. You don't want to keep using very, very high power drugs because there'll be nothing left in the pipeline. But for the more complicated infections, it's oral dosage. And we have looked at that for men with prostate biopsies, work perfectly. But this is the current resistant patterns for UHS. So currently, this is what we are doing uh, here. Just to say, this is what I thought of stones when I came here. <laughs> Perfectly just justified, because I trained in East of Scotland. So they're okay, stones. This is how it was. And now we are truly a, a, a big center uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Marnie. Can you give me your this morning? Um, uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, I obviously work quite closely together. Again, I have quite a few young patients with uh, complex CTI. When it comes to the prophylactic single dose versus the cycle, would you have favourites to try one first before the other? Or I mean, the thing is, I, I usually look at what the culture has drawn before. Yeah. If there, but even for, for immediate prophylaxis, I would rotate them for two reasons. And it doesn't matter which pattern. One, you want to avoid getting resistant to that. And two, things, for example, nitroferentoin, if you give it for a prolonged period of time on its own, which people have done in the past, it can cause pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah. So rotational would mean, even if you forget, you know, because you may not see them for 12 months or the patient may not come, but at least if it's there and they know they have to rotate, it's much easier to avoid side effects as well as resistance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Excuse me. How long would you um, recommend people take their prophylaxis? You're putting me in a difficult spot That's now. <laughs> Look, there is no right answer to it, right? So if if you've done everything else, you're drinking enough, you've got, you know, if it's post quarter you've, you've sorted that one out. If you're doing everything else, I would say carry on for six months and then try to come off it because you don't want to keep going. The downside, the downside is you might get another infection, but then you know that was what was preventing it. But you, for me, you should have done everything else before you become to the antibiotic stage. But I'd give it for three, six months probably and then ask them to come off and then see. Maybe if you come off and you've done everything, because it's the lining, once the bacteria are colonized, you know, once they're shed off, then it's easier. So three to six months, and then you come off and see how you are. Uh, a lot of patients say they don't want to drink more because they're on diuretics, and they don't want to uh, so the way I say, and, and this is also for a lot of male patients as well, so they, when you say drink plenty, you don't want to say drink plenty at 10 o'clock before you go to bed, because then they'll get up at night. <laughs> so what I say is, give a three hour window before you go to bed. So if they have got a tendency to get, I mean some patients don't mind, they're used to getting up at night, but it's, it's fine. But if not, you say, okay, you drink till about 6 or 7 o'clock if you're going to bed at 10. So by the time you sleep, you have offloaded most of it. And that way it's not inconvenient. And it doesn't disturb you. Uh, slightly off question: cranberry juice, cranberry capsules. What are your thoughts? Because that's something that patients often bring up to clinic. Yeah. Some have the benefit from it. Yeah. Uh, the most recent review is split. Mm -hmm. So they say, and in fact, that's what mice are going to say, probably, is that it, it, it's either way. But if if I put myself in the patient shoes and you tried everything else. You want to have it, even if it works for half of them and yeah. doesn't for half. You want to think you'll be in the half that it works. So I, I personally always ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Greek water, you know, 
So I can't tell you what I do because we are in the same boat. <laughs> so when I leave home, I usually have a lot of water so that by the time I start operating, I'm offloaded. And then when I get home, I drink a lot so that before I go to bed, I'm offloaded. Ideally, that's not perfect. Ideally, you want to keep doing it through the day. It just is not, we know that with our job, it just is not possible to sometimes do it. And then this is the way strategy I've devised for me, even though I'm accused at home of not drinking enough myself. But you know, but, but what can you do? Sometimes you have to balance your lifestyle with the job and what you do. Does having um, a nephritis increase your risk of chronic kidney disease? Ah, that's one for, for Kirsty. Yeah. She's nodding, so I'll say yes. yes. So, <laughs> it causes some, so when you have a recurrent, you get scarring. And when you have scarring, you have to then watch out for two things. One is chronic kidney disease. It's not immediate, but it keeps happening. And the second thing is blood pressure monitoring, because that's also necessary. Any more questions? I think I just I would just say again this is all about promoting transplantation as you know and I think one of the things that I feel the pathologists are sharing with looking after transplant patients they're all very good at drinking their wine. Yeah. They just do it. I didn't know that Nikki was the only person who had a hand up. <laughs> if they can do it, we should all do it. And I'm yeah. the worst for drinking. I yeah. know that, but we need to take lessons from the patients that are trying to preserve the kidney that they've been given. Yeah. And I think it's easily forgotten. When you're in the clinic, you've got so many things. You just assume that they drink enough. You just don't even check. And we have looked at how many patients do. These are patients with kidney stones, which can be very painful. Yet when they come, we are looking at the data. When you look at the diaries, they're still not doing enough. And why is that? Either they've forgotten the pain they had because they've moved on. But the stone has it, it'll come back to you. Or, or they're just too busy and, and so but ultimately it's their health. Your health is up to you. People can really recommend what you do. And antibiotics are not a substitute for drinking more fluids. And, and I would say that Siemens who are here who do urinalysis actually have an electronic urinalysis dipstick that will go onto eQuest. So we don't actually have them in the organization at the moment, but uh, if people would be interested, <coughs> that is a little bit of so um, they need to show us that today. If you visit their stand, they're going to see more about how that works. Any more questions before we have lunch? And drinks. Lots of water. Oh, I'm I think you, the way I engage is usually people obstruct when they don't have enough knowledge and enough knowledge. So when you speak to a radiology junior registrar who has just become a registrar, they, you know, but when I would just speak to a consultant and say, this is why we need it. I don't have to work here anymore, I'll tell you an example. There's only one urologist in the country who has been who's been convicted of criminal charges, and I'll tell you why. The young girl came on Friday. This is a true story, by the way. The young girl came on Friday. She was treated with antibiotics, peripyloneuritis, planned for a scan on Saturday. Uh, I think they, they did do a scan with mild hydronephrosis or whatever, planned for a discussion between radiologists and urologists, should be nephrostomy, should be stent, etc. I think, and this is, don't quote me on that, right? The radiologist said, well, I've got something at home, you know, see how she is, otherwise I'll come and nephrostomize. She keeps going on, Sunday morning, she's a bit more unwell, but strong on antibiotics, same discussion, oh, she really needs it. Oh, I've got a big party at my house. If she gets unwell, let me know. Otherwise, we'll do it first thing Monday morning. Monday morning, she has enough frost to me. Septic shock dies. So for me, if somebody is really resistant, and when you have clinically got the need to do it, I think you should either tell them that this thing, you know, that people die of urosepsis, or 
they need to put the neck on the line or if you're, if you're feeling that strong, the department policies have to change, change to reflect that. So, you know, so if I strongly feel this person needs that, then they need it. I mean, you know, we are all, at the end of the day, we are all here for our patients. Yeah. And we want to do the best for them. And if whoever it might be, if there is a, okay, if there is a triple A, they're doing some other thing, they're busy. You understand, can we? But no is never an answer. That's why we are all here on Saturday. Any final questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.